Hey, my friends, it's Tom with Watchman River. Thanks for joining me today. It's another good day that the Lord has made for us to serve him as we await this pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I am in slow mode today, even though I have so much stuff to cover that I can't possibly do it in the time allotted. Um, so we'll see how the Lord leads this. And it's in his hands. And they're very capable. They're way more capable than my hands, I'll tell you that. But uh, before we get busy, you know, usually I like to recommend a snack or something. But today, I don't have time for that. But if I did have time, it would be hot tea and stuffed shells. But I don't have time for that. Let's go to this book, God's Promises for Your Every Need. Okay? Let's go to page 52 where it's Jesus is your everything. These are verses to do with Jesus is your everything. Let's do a few of them. Let's go to Philippians 4, verse 19. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's stay in the same chapter. Philippians 4, go to verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's beautiful. Romans 8, 37. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Psalm 68, 19, blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. I love that, who daily loads us with benefits. You know that the Lord gives you a measurement of strength each day. As thy day, so shall thy strength be. He knows before your day begins exactly what's going to happen through your day. And he gives you enough strength for the day. I always cling to that. Because there are times where I've run out of gas at 3 o'clock. And I'm like, how am I going to live the rest of this day? And then I remember like, wait a minute. As thy day, so shall thy strength be. And then I remember, no, I have enough strength to get through this day. And just don't worry about the next day until it becomes today. Don't worry about tomorrow until it becomes today. And you will get enough strength for that day too. Let's go to John 16. Verse 23 and 24. And in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Now, some people mistake these and think, you know, the name it and claim it, gab it and grab it, say it and spray it. <laughs> Some people associate this with the prosperity gospel. No, look, the things we're asking Christ for are things that align with his perfect will. You know, you getting that BMW probably doesn't align with Jesus' perfect will, okay? One more. Let's go to John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Beautiful beautiful but yeah people love to they love to twist that one all right so look i'm going to take this slow i need even have a few notes here i'm always talking to you guys about puzzle pieces and how they lead to the seven-year tribulation and i believe the rapture is before the seven-year tribulation so they lead to the rapture and the tribulation and i always say don't take one puzzle piece and give it more importance over another puzzle piece because what are puzzle pieces? When you pick up your puzzle, you can look at one all day long. You'll never know what the entire picture is. You're holding one piece. But as the pieces work together and start clicking in, you start seeing the full picture. Even before the puzzle's done, right? You can be three quarters of the way done and go, all right, I get it now. I'm seeing the picture. That's exactly what's happening today as we await the rapture of the church and the seven-year tribulation that will be after the rapture is we have seen all the puzzle pieces. We have all the pieces now and we're watching them click into place and we're seeing this picture of the seven-year tribulation. And again, I'm going to say, don't ever put too much importance on one piece of the puzzle. Don't do that. They all have to work together to make that picture. Okay. One of the most major puzzle pieces I've ever seen is October 7th. When that war started in Israel, I thought, okay, this is it. This is the, I knew it that day, and I, I know it more now than I did then. This is the war that leads to the tribulation, to the, to the covenant talked about in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. This is the war that will lead to that covenant, meaning this is the war that will lead to the rapture. 
because we're going to be taken out of here and then that covenant's going to get signed. A puzzle piece, a major puzzle piece. And I've been saying it since that date. I don't think the war in Israel is going to end and we'll have three years of just, you know, and all of a sudden we'll talk about the rapture in three years. I, I don't think, I think this war at some point, I don't know if it's when they finish off Hamas in Rafa, like they're doing now. I don't know if they then go into a, a southern Lebanon with Hezbollah and, and go there. I, I But at some point, the world, and the world is saying it right now, stop, stop, stop. The world's going to say something about peace and safety, and then sudden destruction is going to come. That's the rapture, I believe. And I think we're very close to that. Okay? But, like I said, major puzzle piece, Israel, October 7th. Let's talk about other puzzle pieces. Now, again, I'm going to say to you, don't take one of these puzzle pieces. When I talk about this stuff, don't take it and say, oh, Tom's saying this is what leads to the rapture. This one thing right here. No, I'm just saying, look at all the pieces because it's a fascinating time to be alive when you take one piece at a time, one puzzle piece at a time and just look at look at how it starts painting that picture. We're living in incredible times, all right? So don't take these individually. Let's look at all of this collectively. In Genesis 1, verse 14, it says, Then God said, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, He's talking about the sun and the moon and the stars. And let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Well, we're living with a calendar. We know the sun is used for and the moon is used for days and years. We know that. Well, he said himself, it's for signs and seasons. Now, confusion always comes in here because people start saying, oh, you're worshiping the stars and the sun and the moon. It's like astrology. No, astronomy is much different than astrology. Astrology is is Satan taking God's stars and sun and moon that God has there for signs and seasons and twisting it like he always does. He's not creative. He can only twist what's there. He can't create anything. But he took astrology, the horoscope, zodiac, all that garbage. It's all satanic. So now some believers will say, well, don't look at the stars and the moon and the, and the sun for, for signs. But But God said it. He put him there for signs and season. He said it. Okay. So with that in mind, I'm going to talk about something I don't talk about a lot. I'm going to talk about what happened on September 23rd, 2017. Many, many, many people believe this was the called the revelation 12 sign. Some don't. It's okay. It's okay. We can have disagreements. I happen to believe it was the revelation 12 sign. I have very close friends who are really great believers in God who don't. It's okay. It's okay. We can have differences. So, Revelation 12, 1. Now a great sign appeared in the heavens, or in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. A few years before that happened, somebody figured out it was going to happen in the stars. And they were like, whoa, look at this. This is Revelation 12. Okay? And like I said, I'm going to clear, I'm going to keep saying, like, many people don't believe this was a sign. They don't want to think that the stars and the sun and the moon are for signs and seasons. So they're like, no, no, that's nothing to do with it. It's okay. It's okay. We can all still be in Christ Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. The blood and the finished work of Jesus are beautiful. Um, but I think that's a puzzle piece, what happened September 23rd, 2017. Many people thought the rapture was going to happen that day. I wasn't following it close enough. I didn't think it was the time period of the rapture. I didn't think it was the time period of the rapture, even though it's imminent. I didn't think it until 2022. That's when I started saying, it's coming soon. It's coming soon. That rapture is coming soon. But many people thought that September 23rd, 2017 was the date of the rapture. Now, many people are saying what I believe. I think now, looking back, I think it's a seven-year warning sign of some kind. I really do, because we're almost at that seven-year mark. We're almost there. And every and again, I'm not just looking at this one puzzle piece saying, this is it. I'm going again, look at all the things that are happening around the world. All the puzzle pieces have come together, and they're forming a picture. And the last few ones are just being clicked into place. I think the rapture is the last puzzle piece, and I think we're close to that. All right, so that's a puzzle piece. Let's look at another puzzle piece. Do you know that exactly seven years 
after that thing that happened, the Revelation 12 sign in the sun and the moon and the stars, exactly to the day, seven years later, this is what's going on, okay? The United Nations Summit of the Future. It's the 22nd and the 23rd of September, 2024. It's a multilateral solutions for a better tomorrow. I'm going to literally, if I remember, I'm literally going to put the link to the UN site where you can actually look at this because it's pretty amazing. Listen to some of this and think of it as a puzzle piece. Don't say Tom's saying that the summit of the future is what makes the rapture. No, no puzzle piece. Thank you. What is the summit of the future? The summit is a high level event bringing world leaders together to forge a new international consensus on how we deliver a better present and safeguard the future. This once, I'm always reading between the lines with these, some of these things, this once in a generation opportunity serves as a moment to mend eroded trust and demonstrate that international cooperation can effectively tackle current challenges as well as those that have emerged in recent years or may yet be over the horizon. We already have the what, and the what is in bold letters. We already have the what, in quotes, in the form of many existing agreements and commitments, starting with the UN Charter and including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the 2030 Agenda, the Paris Agreement, and many others. This will be achieved through an action-oriented outcome document called the Pact of the Future. The pact will be negotiated and endorsed by countries in the lead-up to and during this summit of the future in September of 2024. The result will be a world and an international system that is better prepared to manage the challenges we face now and in the future for the sake of all humanity and for future generations. I find this to be incredibly interesting that this happened seven years to the day after that sign. Am I putting any kind of weight that I shouldn't be putting in this? No, it's a puzzle piece and there's many puzzle pieces, but I find it fascinating. The sustainable development goals are badly off track, they're saying. The summit of the future will create the conditions in which implementation of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development can be more readily achieved. It will do so by building on the outcome of the 2023 SDG summit. In addition, it will result in improvements to international cooperation that enable us to solve problems together. What does this all mean? It's another puzzle piece, but it's fascinating in these days. Let's look at another one, okay? Let's look at a little bit of AI right now because we know that AI was unleashed on the world last year. 2023 became the first year. Now it's just like, if you're not using it or about to use it, or if you're not implementing it in your business, you are behind the curve. Everyone's doing it, even though it hallucinates, which is a, a fancy word for lies. You know, listen to this. News publishers sound the alarm on Google's new AI infused search and they warn of catastrophic impacts. The AI artificial intelligence doomsday clock appears ready to strike midnight for publishers. Now they're talking about news publishers, okay? Google on Tuesday, yesterday, announced that it will infuse its ubiquitous search engine with its powerful artificial intelligence model, Gemini drawing on the rapidly advancing technology to directly answer user queries at the top of result pages, Google will do the Googling for you, the company explained. In other words, users will soon no longer have to click on the links displayed in search results to find the information they are seeking. I find this fascinating because basically what they're saying is they'll be able to spoon feed you the information that you're supposedly looking for that they can give you the exact information that they want you to see. This AI stuff is, I think it's a huge part of the beast system and it's happening so fast. And I've said this before, and I really mean it. It's happening so fast that even if I push Bible prophecy aside and my belief in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I look at AI and I'm like, the world can't last too long with this technology. And many secular people are saying that who don't even believe in God. 
Like, no, this is the end of humanity, and it's going to spiral quickly. We're in the very last days. We are in the very last days. And I am watching puzzle piece after puzzle piece after puzzle piece assemble the picture of the seven-year tribulation, which I believe could start at any time. And that's why I tell you every day. I'm looking up every day. We're there. I don't see this as two years down the road. I don't see this as five years down the road. We're there. We're waiting for the rapture. Because this technology and all the things that are going on and all the nefarious plans that world leaders have for us is coming too quickly. It's too rapid. It's just coming at us like a bullet. Now, none of this stuff should worry you if you belong to the Lord Jesus. None of it. You don't have to be worried. He's like, a, he's, you know, many people have really terrible experiences with their earthly fathers. Oh, our father in heaven, you know, don't ever compare him to your earthly father because he is good. And he's going to say, son, go get your bride. And Jesus is going to get us soon. You don't have to worry when you belong to the Lord. All right, let's look at what time. Oh, man. Let's just quickly go through some stuff that's going on right now. This is from the Jerusalem Post. And it's just incredible. The IDF reveals Hamas terrorists use United Nations vehicles and the UNRWA compound as a cover in Rafah. Any surprise there? And they revealed it yesterday that during operational activity in eastern Rafah on Saturday, terrorists were identified in UNRWA's central logistics compound alongside UN vehicles. We give a lot of money to that. In the footage, several terrorists and gunfire can be seen near UN vehicles and in the area of their logistics warehouse compound in eastern Rafah, which is a central point for the distribution of aid on UNRWA's behalf in the Gaza Strip. It's just incredible. You know, if we had heard this 10 years ago, we'd be like, what's going on on Earth? Wait, the United Nations is in bed with the people doing this? This is from the Times of Israel. Civilian killed and five troops hurt by Hezbollah missile. Northern residents protest in action. They're getting fed up. The people in northern Israel that have left their homes eight months ago, they want to go home. You get that. An Israeli civilian uh, was killed and five soldiers were wounded in a Hezbollah anti-tank guided missile attack against the military position near the northern community of Adamit on Tuesday as hostilities between Israel and the Lebanese terror group continued on Independence Day with residents of northern Israel protesting against the government for not resolving their seven-month-long displacement from their homes. Like I said, you can get that. They don't feel like Israel's doing enough. You know, their, their response isn't harsh enough. But man, would you want to lead Israel today? Can you imagine the whole world screaming, stop what you're doing? And your citizens are saying, you're not going far enough? You know, this is from All Israel News. Northern Israel under threat. Hezbollah's menacing drone force raises concerns. There, It's picked up again. There's a lot of drones, a lot of drones. That new weaponry, you know, we never even thought of 20 years ago. Over the past several years, the use of drones in armed conflicts, such as the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan and the Russia-Ukraine war, as well as by several Iranian proxy militias have revolutionized battlefield tactics around the world. They're saying Hamas uses cheap, small commercial drones to great effect during its surprise attack on October 7th, even, the, even causing the IDF to hurriedly install metal cages over its tanks to prevent drones from dropping explosives on them. It's the world we're living in now, right? Also, a little cupcake party happened, little tea, a few cookies, some cake. I'm just kidding. Uh, the Times of Israel is reporting that Hezbollah hosts senior Hamas delegation to discuss Gaza and beyond. They had a little party. Uh, Hassan Nasrallah, head of Lebanon's Hezbollah terror group, has reportedly hosted a Hamas delegation cupcake party. I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm being goofy. No, there was no cupcakes there. Uh, headed by Khalil Elaya the Palestinian terror group's deputy Politburo head in Gaza. They discussed developments in Gaza and the region, including negotiations for a truce and a hostage deal, as well as the anti-Israel student encampments around the world. 
The meeting confirmed the unity of the Iran-aligned axis of resistance and the continued efforts to achieve victory over Israel, which won't happen, no matter the sacrifices, the report says. No, Israel's not going anywhere. If you think they're going somewhere, you're not getting it. No, it's if the hand of God is on that nation, they're not going to be destroyed. They're going to go through rough times during the seven-year tribulation, and many of them are going to die. Hopefully, they find Jesus before they do. But that nation is not going to be destroyed. Uh, this is from Israel Today. The IDF confirms that it eliminated a senior Hezbollah commander in a targeted strike near Tyre last night. Northern Israel is on high alert. This is reportedly the highest ranking Hezbollah official to be eliminated so far in this war that happened last night. Uh, Hezbollah fired 60 missiles at the IDF base on Mount Moron. The IDF reports only light damage and no casualties. That happened early this morning. So that's what's going on in Israel. Also, um, they've got this inauguration going on soon in Taiwan. And China is not happy about it. And they said that uh, 45 Chinese aircraft have been detected around Taiwan. And they said it had detected 45 military aircraft around Taiwan. The highest single day number this year and coming less than a week before the self-ruled island inaugurates its new president, who China does not like. Also, this I can't verify, so I'm just giving that disclaimer. This was happening right before I hit record. But it said the president of Turkey has held an emergency meeting with the heads of the country's intelligence organizations due to news of a planned military coup, according to a Turkish source. Again, I can't verify that. That was hitting right before I hit record, but I thought I'd let you know. But I can't verify that yet. What else? Sun unleashes a massive X8.7 solar flare, the most intense of this solar cycle. Another flare, solar flare, happened on Monday, bringing back a chance to see the northern lights on Wednesday. Maybe today. Maybe today. Wildfires in western Canada are exploding again. It's forced the evacuation of several thousand people from their homes. And it's, once again, they're starting up again. I don't think they ever ended, really, all the fires in Canada. They went right through the winter. But they're starting again, and it's, you know, horrible. Earthquakes, 38 over 4.0 in the last 24 hours, and 8 over 5.0. There you go. This is just, what, what time is it? This is just incredible. Out of control inflation. It now takes at least $177,000 for a family of four to live comfortably in the United States. Now, that seems like a lot of money. to I don't know what kind of comfort they're talking about, but I know inflation is crazy. And I don't understand how anyone who's just got the median income of this country can, can raise a family. It's crazy. But this, this says a recent study has revealed the incomes needed for families to live comfortably across the United States. And the stark contrast in the cost of living between states is startling. This study revealed that in the most expensive states, I'm sure they're talking about like California, um, families need nearly $300,000 a year to simply live comfortably. Again, I don't know what that means. What, what does comfortably mean? Does that mean you have a new car and a really nice house and you're eating out all the time? I don't know what comfortably means because that seems like a lot of money. The least expensive state requires about half that salary, still over $100,000. Meanwhile, the average annual salary in the United States is $59,428, or $28 per hour as of May of 2024. Now, there are a lot of people struggling. I've seen it in my area. I've just never seen so many people struggling in my entire life. I'm almost 61. You know, yeah, we're, we're in the last days. Next, we've got a restaurant apocalypse is starting to sweep across America. And that is really bad news for the U.S. economy. You can get a really good idea of how the U.S. economy is doing by watching restaurants in your area. When the economy is booming, the restaurant parking lots are full and chains are feverishly establishing new locations. But when the economy is struggling, restaurants get a lot less traffic and poor performing locations get shut down. Yeah, I just read a thing this morning. There's a chain here in the United States called Red Lobster. It's been around forever and they're closing hundreds 
of restaurants right now. And they're saying that um, they're probably going to file for bankruptcy within the next week. So if you want your lobster, go get it now if you can afford it, you know. All right, this is nothing but clown world. So put your clown shoes on, your little hat, maybe your nose. You guys, I said once, I, I talked about wearing a red clown nose. I've gotten about 10 of them in the mail. I'm not kidding. I got a box full of clown noses. <laughs> you guys are funny. All right, get ready. Here we go, clown world. <sighs> this is from Discover Magazine. Gene-edited fungus could imitate burger patties as the next vegetarian sensation. Fungus burgers. <laughs> These days, when it comes to meat alternatives, most eyes are on lab-grown and plant-based products. But one of the latest breakthrough in sustainable, cruelty-free food comes from yet another kingdom of life, fungi. <laughs> The human fungus bond has been cementing for thousands of years during which our ancestors found countless ways to fit these nutritious organisms into their diet. I think yogurt's got some of those cultures and stuff. Probably the same thing. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. Uh, now putting a distinctly modern twist on the relationship, scientists at UC Berkeley reported in Nature Communications earlier this year that they had genetically engineered meat-like patties from mold. I'll just have water. Thank you. I'll just have a nice cold glass of water. I can do without mold burgers. You know, I, they don't, I don't need a burger that bad. You know, just have a steady diet of water and maybe pretzels if they don't have bug flour in them. But anyway, all right, let's get to testimony of the day. Okay, Richard, I was saved as an eight-year-old child. My mom gave me a Bible with a red cover that year for my birthday. She was killed in a car accident when I was 15 years old, 44 years ago. I'm now 59, and I still have that precious red-covered Bible with the inscription written by my mom. Wow. I always, man, that's, I just can't imagine losing mom at that age. But praise God. He's got you, and you've got your red Bible, and that is awesome. Thank you. Let's do a comment or two of the day. Jules, as a nurse... I just got fired from my job for refusing to inject affirming hormones. This would have been the perfect job with a perfect schedule. I was not aware when I was hired that it was part of this particular job. I never would have accepted the position. Now I'm unemployed for not going against my faith and refusing to harm a patient. The world is dark. Be the light. Wow. I'm proud of you. Praise God. Praise God. Cass, I grew up believing Jesus died for my sins and said the salvation prayer over and over, but lived a fruitless spiritual life until my late 20s. It was then that I realized I had to die to myself before I could have a real relationship with the Father in Christ Jesus and to live life abundantly. I no longer craved the things of this world and for the first time experienced a love I'd never experienced before. I'm not perfect and I fail every day, but my love for the Lord continues to grow more and more as I stand in awe of his mercy and grace. That is beautiful. That is, let's do one more. Kales. I have been a Christian my entire life, but only the beginning of this year after a spiritual experience did I become devout. I am a completely different person. I think God is waking his children up because something is about to happen. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Yeah. You know what's about to happen? The rapture. I said it. <laughs> I say it every day. That's what's about to happen. Because all the puzzle pieces have painted the picture. They've all converged. And we're just waiting now. But if you don't know what Jesus did for you, and you don't belong to him, my goodness, you're getting ready to face the most terrible year since mankind was created. That's what it says about the seven-year tribulation. The worst years to be on earth since mankind was created. If you think living through this world now is dark with the rumors of wars and the earthquakes and fires and droughts and floods and, and all, you know, the world leaders going cuckoo. If you think this is all hard, you have no idea what's coming and it's coming soon. So every day I beg and I plead those who don't belong to Jesus 
to give him a try. <laughs> believe in his finished work on the cross, that he died, he was buried, and he resurrected, and believe in the power of the blood that Jesus shed. I know, it's graphic. Nobody wants to talk about blood. It sounds so violent, but you know what? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who the Bible said spoke and nothing became everything. Jesus, with the power of his words, created everything out of nothing. And that same Jesus came to earth, leaving a throne in heaven, and he came here to die for your sins. He paid for your sins with his blood. He's the only one that had the power to. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God could have said, look, mankind has sinned, they've fallen, so forget them. I'm done. But he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. And Jesus willingly came here. And he knew his whole life, he knew it was going to end with his bloodshed. He knew he was going to end up on the cross. But he did it because he loves you and he wants to spend eternity with you. Now I'm saying this to you and I, I, I truly believe that the spirit isn't drawing you. This is just gobbledygook. You won't, you're probably not even listening now. But if you're listening to this and you're just have any kind of inkling to move your head a little closer to watch, the spirit of God is probably drawing you and this moment may never come again. For you to say to Jesus, and all you have to say is Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I think the wrong things. I know I've done the wrong things. And if I'm hearing this correctly, you paid for my sins with your blood. I want that. I want to believe. I want to have faith in that blood that it will wash me white as snow. I want to have faith in that blood that once I believe in the power of that blood, it will remove every sin I've ever done or will ever do as far away from me as the East is from the West. And I believe in your finished work that you came here and you ended up getting brutalized and nailed to a cross. Jesus' last words on the cross were, it is finished because the sin debt had been paid in full. And I believe that. And I believe then you were placed in a tomb and you rose again the third day. Oh, Jesus, you sound like the perfect Savior. You are the perfect Savior. I'm putting my belief and my trust in you and in that blood and in your finished work. When you do that, you're saved. You're sealed unto the day of redemption. He'll never let you out of the palm of his hand. You can rest in his arms. Every night when you go to bed, you can say, Jesus, I belong to you. I'm resting in you. He'll give you rest that you won't even be able to figure out. Many, many people have said it. I can't even figure out why I feel this way when they start trusting in Jesus, when that journey of salvation starts because Jesus paid it all. And all you have to do is say, yes, I believe I'm resting in you now. And he'll give you peace that surpasses understanding. It says in Philippians, you won't even be able to figure it out. But I have to give you the flip side of this. If you're hearing this message and you're one of those, and you know what? Sorry to say, like, wide is a path to destruction. So most people will say this. I don't want to believe in that garbage. I don't believe that. I'm more good than bad. So if there is a heaven, I'll get in just because I'm a good person. No, you need your sins paid for with blood. And Jesus did that. And that's why you're not going to say, oh, you're unfair. You're sending me to hell because of my sin. That's so unfair. No, you're going to say, whoa, I heard it on earth. I heard Jesus paid for my sins with his blood. And I said, no, I don't want that. I'm more good than bad. And your good's not going to send you to hell. Your sin is. But Jesus gave you a payment. He provided the payment, his blood, a serious payment. So you have a choice to make. You either say, nah, I'll take my chances. And you face Jesus on judgment day. And he says, away from me, I never knew you. Or you say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I want payment. I don't want to face you on judgment day with my sins exposed. I want them gone. I want to be white as snow, washed because of your blood when I face you. And then you'll face him a lot sooner because the rapture is about to happen. And we're all going to be face to face with Jesus. Those who believe in the power of that blood and in his finished work, we belong to our Savior and we're going to see him soon. So choose wisely. That's all, all I can do is warn. That's all I can do. I can't, you know, I can't twist your arm. 
but I'm going to shut the camera off and I'm going to pray for every single person, you included, that watched this video. And if we're not raptured today, and why not? Today's a perfectly good day for the rapture. But if we're not, God willing, I will see you guys tomorrow. I love you guys.